You start the process by creating a database. Let's give the database name Hypersizer V7. My name Craig. Uh, the next step we will perform is to import from the airframe database template go to the advanced form the custom analysis selections and the database defaults from that template database close and close so now we have a database set up to rapidly perform the airframe sizing optimization. Let's create a project. We'll call it wing box sizing C27 to indicate 27 structural components from root to tip. The software supports uh, NASTRAN, Abacus, and ANSYS as FEM file formats. We'll use Abacus today. Hypersizer will use the project name you defined and try to locate an existing model. The model does not exist with this name as indicated with a red font. Let's find one that does exist. Go to this folder location, FEA, Abacus, Technique 1, and we'll choose the WB14 model for today. Note that the output file associated with Abacus um, has the extension FIL and was autofilled by the software and located by the software. At this point we will go ahead and import the model. You can see the status bar at the bottom left. Uh, go to the load cases tab and you'll see that we have two load cases imported. One a 2.5G upgust and the other a minus 1G down gust. Let's click on the FEM viewer icon from the ribbon. Here you see the finite element model as imported into Hypersizer. We have a feature where we can mirror the model, so this may help a little bit in understanding the uh, structural application. Along with the grids and elements, Hypersizer is importing the initial layout of properties. That is, the colors represent which elements are assigned to have the same laminate, or to represent a single panel bay spanning from rib to rib and from spar to spar. Hypersizer refers to these FEM areas as structural components, which are sized to be their optimum design. The internal substructure of the FEM is imported and sized as well. Let's turn off the mesh and put the display into the transparent mode. And by doing so, uh, you can kind of get a better idea of the rib and rib beams used uh, and the internal substructure. In fact, what we could do next is turn off the uh, the shell elements and you can get a better view of the bar and beam elements that were imported. Uh, let's turn those uh, back on. And the FEA solver solution is imported as well. For example, I'm going to display the FEA computed uh, NX axial running load. Uh, the color scale um, is uh, automatically defined for the peak of any element. So if we turn off the, the beams, uh, then you can see the peak shell element loads. I can also uh, reduce the number of significant figures. And so we can see here that in the upper surface, the uh, 2.5G EPGUS load case is producing close to around 14,000 pounds of um, axial running load and the upper skin and if I go to the next load case the negative negative 1G down load case uh, we see a tension load of around 5700 pounds per inch. Let's uh, remove the graphics and from the setup form we will 
invoke the sizing form uh, because uh, we haven't used this form yet um, is grayed out with no data. Let's clean up a little bit. Let's remove the database explorer and let's minimize the project setup form so we can make the sizing form front and center. Now we will follow the process highlighted by the orange boxes. We will create an assembly using the graphics. The graphics appear as displaying the model as we last used it. So that's um, do not mirror anymore and set it up so we can uh, get the best view. Let's also remove the uh, the data so we have a clean legend. Now when the graphics is open the pig form is ready to be used to identify which components to include in the assembly. You could uh, click interactively or if you're quite familiar with your model numbering scheme the way the FEM was set up with the property identification um, you could simply type in the range that you want to include in your assembly which in this case is the upper surface so we will name it accordingly and um, you can hit the update pick to see what is in your list, your active list, and you can turn on the icons to see better. And uh, the purpose of being to um, have a chance to back out if this is not what you wanted to be in your assembly. We do, so we'll go ahead and say uh, we do not want to create another one at this time, and so we will apply. By doing so, it uh, puts you in the assembly mode viewing. We want to go into component mode where we have the assembly on full model. And I can turn on the markers to indicate uh, the division between the components. Um, you can take your cursor and go through the legend in this manner to see the components. Um, you can also turn on the IDs as well and see that 106 is near the root and 123 is nearer the tip. These IDs will come in handy when we start the sequencing process uh, of the laminates. Let's next turn on the uh, markers that indicate the buckling span distances um, for the components. So I'll turn off the mesh and I will put the uh, view in a transparent manner where well, you can see here like in 113 um, we have the marker going from spar to spar and from rib to rib. So this information is used in the, the buckling analysis and if we were superimposing pressure um, the offline FEA, offline to FEA would be the computation of the bending moments and out of plane shear loads. Other data um, that are automatically set up during the model import includes uh, material axes, as we see here. Let me turn off the buckling. And you can see in the orange color here the representation of, of, of each element's uh, direction. And this, of course, is an indication of the intent of where the stiffener would be uh, oriented as well as the zero degree ply of the composite laminate. Um, one other piece of data of, of relevance would be the element normals and you can see um, I plotted them by clicking this icon and um, they indicate to us the uh, the direction of the stiffener. The sign convention is such that the stiffener is opposite of the direction of the normal so uh, indeed the stiffener then would be uh, on the inside of that OML surface. All of this FEM data feeds directly into the sizing process. So along with the FEA solver solution of internal loads, we have the geometric data um, 
from the model itself. Now let's go back to the sizing form and essentially everything we've done to up to this point has been a setup process of basically setting up or explaining how the FEM model is used and the loads are used. The, the next step which is the sizing process the quick sizing process is extremely quick and easy to perform and uh, we begin the process by now selecting what material system we want to use a composite we want to do quick sizing uh, again following the box indication we select concept we will uh, use the unaxial stiffened family an eye bonded we can apply this concept to all of the panel bays of that assembly so we'll say OK and we do that now you see for the first time uh, the image of the cross-section with dimensions shown and um, the next step would be to right click to choose material we will use a tape and we're going to use the AS4-30502 tape DT uh, to indicate that we're using damage tolerance strain allowables in the range of 5,000 to 6,000 micro inches. Um, we will select this for the skin and we will select that same tape for the stiffener as well. Go back to the home tab and then perform the quick sizing. And it's done. It's optimized that assembly for you. This is some diagnostic information you could look at later. Uh, but essentially the data of most relevance is now shown uh, for each one of the components. So for component 106 what you're looking at are the dimensions that go along with the labels over here. Uh, the value being the optimum value for that geometric dimension such as spacing is 11 inches here for that component 106. These columns represent the composite data um, so it would be the percent of 0, 45, 90s and this is the actual ply counts in the same direction so we have a total of 54 plies in this skin. Uh, 29 of those plies are 0, 19 plies are 45 and 6 are in the 90 direction. Uh, we can plot the cross section here to give you an indication of the relative uh, proportion of it. Um, again, though, we are sizing uh, on a ply count type basis, not yet doing a laminate design. Um, let's go to one other component, maybe uh, 119. And we can see here um, the difference in um, the size if we look at it this way. Uh, it's got a wider flange at the foot and if we go uh, one more down maybe we look at say 121 and view that cross section you can see this one is a more narrow relatively speaking stiffener and we have in this one um, uh, 10 plies total with about 30 uh, percent zero in the um, zero degree direction what we can do at this point um, is to click the margin icon from the ribbon and it pulls up the graphics automatically for you. Um, let's turn off uh, the last used markers and um, you can see here the margins of safety are all very close to zero. Uh, 0 0.001, 0 0 0.001 again, uh, 0.04 in the green color. So uh, six of those components range between 0.02 and 0.1, where 11 of them go from 0 to 0 0.02. Uh, you can take this away, and if you wanted to see unit weight, uh, you could see the weights uh, of the panels um, likewise. Let's go to the laminate skin tab, hit the apply percentages icon. It brings up the software in this manner where as we go from say the root of the wing and go up the legend you can see the percent of 45s increasing and this has to do with the fact that at the lighter loaded tip local buckling becomes a critical failure mode requiring more zero excuse me more 45 
and 90 degree ply is to prevent that mode shape between stiff nerves. Plotting the zero degree, we see an opposite trend where the highly loaded root panels have a higher percentage of zero degree plies and reduce as you go toward the tip. If we plot the thickness here, um, you can see that the thickest part is actually not at the root. The thickest skin is actually three bays from the root and that has to do with the distribution of loads that we saw earlier. So let's uh, turn on the legend where we can actually see the number of ply drops. We'll turn off the previous legend and if we uh, zoom in here you can see um, it's quite useful to know the uh, information drawn on the model and so uh, the total down here is 35 plies, 40 plies, 44 plies, 48 plies. Uh, the display gets hard to see. It's always useful to go in the transparent mode 50 and 53. So you can see here we have 57 total plies and then back to 55 and 54 and you can see though that we uh, are increasing zeros from 25, 27, 28 and 29. Let's take one more quick look at the loads here to uh, fully understand the scenario. Let's turn off the transparency here and uh, we have the loads kind of being smoothed over right now. Let's go in the unsmooth manner. Maybe having the mesh shown is good. Turning the labels off. And so here's your NX load for that controlling load case. Uh, here's the load for NY and you can see the NY load here is actually higher uh, very close to that panel bay and lastly if we look at the shear loads uh, you can certainly see the shear load being higher uh, in this these panel bay this panel bay more so than it is in this panel bay. Now we will transition from quick sizing to detailed sizing. All quick sizing design and fabrication criteria will be copied to detailed sizing. Before doing so, it is useful to know what is about to happen next. Quick sizing produces optimum designs by fully defining each cross-sectional dimension and the ply counts in each of the 0, 45, and 90 directions for each of the objects such as the skin, web and foot and cap of the stiffener. Looking at spacing, we can see that each component has its own unique set of variables. As we go from component 116 to 117, spacing is 6.3 and for component 118 the value is 6. A convenient integer number that we will use as an example. To automatically create variable and material bounds using quick sizing, let's hit the detailed sizing radio button on the ribbon and then we will hit the set variables icon. The set variables button pulls up the set variables form this form allows you to define the low and high range of values to be used in detailed sizing per each variable. In component 118 as the example, the range used for spacing using 6 inches as the optimum value and a min of 0.95 times 6 will give us a minimum value of 5.7 inches and a maximum value of 1.05 times 6 equals 6.3 inches. The form also allows you to specify how many laminates to generate that match the optimal ply count targets of the previous quick sizing ply count optimization. The software is now running and creating the laminates for all the different components. It's 
complete. So let's take a look at the generated skin laminate. We'll just use the very first one in the list and open it up. And you can see that um, it's a 17 ply laminate. It has 45, uh, 90, 45 and 90 um, on the outside of the laminate, identified as full assembly plies. We'll get to this in the second video. Uh, probably of more interest is the stiffener laminate that was automatically generated, which is quite a bit more challenging. And you can see it's a 41 total ply laminate that has uh, these additional L2, L3, and L4 columns to indicate the actual ply drop sequence um, as you go from the flange to the web uh, to the freestanding flange. Again, this is uh, a topic we'll cover in more detail in the video number two, Advanced Quick Sizing Optimization. With these laminates generated uh, specifically for each component based on the ply counts from the previous quick sizing process, we can now perform detailed sizing uh, for the entire assembly. and um, it runs relatively quickly here. We're halfway done. And um, what we're going to have uh, at the completion of this is a well-defined design. Note that uh, for the component 118, the table has been filled out with a 5.7 and 6.3 as we previously described. Now at this point we have a well find design with layups along with all cross-sectional dimensions and these optimum values are based on achieving a positive margin of safety for all active failure modes. Going to the failure tab you can see um, many potential failure analyses that could have been performed. Um, to perform a failure analysis you just toggle the cell on or off. To isolate uh, different failure criteria such as a composite laminate strength approach, you could click in the category down here and to further filter uh, if you're interested in the web, and click the web object and you can see uh, the three margins of safety for that that's been activated. Let's go ahead and turn all these back on again and turn on all the objects by clicking off. And we can now sort by margin of safety. And you can see that for component 118, um, the composite strength laminate compression uh, is controlling. And you can see that for uh, the flange bottom load set 200, the uh, second load case is controlling, whereas for the other side of the panel, um, the first load case is controlling. Now if we were to look at say component 117, uh, you can see here that we have um, a different controlling failure mode which is cri crippling. And if we went to uh, 116, um, very close to zero margin of safety and if we go to 115, um, we can see that we are having yet a third controlling failure mode called local buckling of the spacing span. I would like to point out to you that we are allowing this optimization to consider post buckling and we're allowing the skin to go into initial instability at 50 percent of the ultimate load and we um, indicate that with a minus 0.5 <coughs> excuse me I was actually 50% uh, at limit load and so we indicate that with putting in a required uh, minus 0.5 margin of safety for that failure mode and you can see here that in this case the actual margin of safety was minus 0.48 which um, to put it in a, a relative terms to all the other margins of safety that's a 0 0.039 margin of safety as we report right here.
These failure analyses are based on well-defined stiffener designs with complete detail of the skin and stiffener laminates. Let's go back to the highly loaded component 106, which is near the root of the wing. As you can see here, there's a 53% percentage of zero degree plies in the skin. By viewing the cross-section, we can see now not only the cross-sectional shape, but this time plies are explicitly defined for both the skin and the stiffener. This is how the parts will be fabricated. At first inspection, you notice a lot of green color in both the skin and stiffener. Green indicates a zero degree ply. Red is 90 and blue for 45s. As I move my cursor over the plies, notice the bottom left corner updating and notice in particular the new unique ply ID and the description. So in this case, right here, I happen to be on unique ply 65, which is the web right base laminate local ply number 10. Going down to the cap flange, the freestanding flange, you can see a difference in color here and this um, is representing what we refer to as the cap charge. And so this happens to be uh, ply number 7 of the cap charge. The manner in which hypersizer defines these sublaminates is dictated by the fabrication criteria form, which we get to from here. Um, of interest are your options on the right hand side and the definition on the left. So note that the cap charge is an additional laminate sandwiched between the base laminates. The ply pack is also an additional charge basically in the web and the foot charge has uh, an additional ability to have what we define as a plank that would attach the foot to the skin. This um, topic will be covered in more detail in the advanced optimization tutorial. Let's take a look now at the outboard wing panel component 121. It's, it's lighter loaded and you can see here it has a 31% zero degree ply. View the cross section and again you can see a less green and more red and blue indicating the higher percent of 90 and 45 degree plies. Note that the ply pack is included in this design. By now, it's probably become apparent to you that different laminates are defined for each of these panel base skins. Our next step in the process is to sequence these laminates for fabrication. That is, to determine which plies remain continuous and which drop off as you go from the thicker wing root to the thinner outboard panels. We do this by going to the laminate skin, laminate skin tab and we're going to sequence, use the sequence function here and uh, let's make this full screen um, and we invoke it. It's giving us a message asking us if we want to generate the transitions now. We say yes and it's displaying to us the transitions that it automatically defined. And so basically from root to tip um, are the boundaries where um, we're trying to find contiguous and compatible laminates. Now after these transitions have been automatically defined, uh, we can go to quick sequencing first and get a result. And note that we're looking at um, 83 individual global plies and um, 110 drops and adds and 332 ply cuts. We can improve this design by 
going to what we call a full sequencing and let's just move it over here to start with so we'll see how the design improves and the reduced global ply count and reduced individual drops and adds. We can also use this feature called shuffle to IML OML to do uh, a much more substantial improvement reducing global plus to 51 individual drops and adds to 46 zero simultaneous drops and adds and three plies not interleaved. You can sort the individual panel bay laminates um, by putting your cursor in the column. Here we're looking at bay number 122 and you can see a symmetric and balanced with 11 plies. If we go to 118 um, you can see that it's got 25 plies also symmetric and balanced and so forth. So you can see this tool is helpful for doing a trade between weight savings or the number or reduced uh, number of drops and adds. So for a one pound difference in weight uh, we vastly improve the design. The tool is not only matching up the optimal skin laminates across the panel bay but also concurrently trading the underlying stiffener design. So it has the ability to find compatible laminates by having the freedom to change the stiffener shape, size, and layups simultaneously. Let's take a look at now at this design um, in a built-up fashion. Pulls up the graphics in this mode and you can take your cursor and see how the plies would be actually laid down on the tool in the fabrication process like this. You can also go to the exploded view where you can see it in this manner. Let's change to the global plot configuration dialog and uh, what we'll do is expand the distance between the layers so that you can see it much better. Alright, that's probably good enough. And so if you look at it in this manner, you can see here uh, the ply drops. Now, um, granted it's a little bit hard to orient, because the curvature is a little bit hard to or orient um, these plies so that you can get a straight elevation view. And um, but you can kind of see here again it's the same data uh, just represented in a different manner. Um, another way you can get this information is draw what we call a cut plane or a cut line. I go from the tip to the root here and you can see um, like if I zoom in here you can see what's happening maybe a little bit better. You can change the distances or the thicknesses of the of the of the ply data. Going back to the sequencing form now um, we can uh, export uh, the spreadsheets in different formats in CATIA, the FibreSim uh, formats. Uh, let's use the CATIA and um, you can essentially uh, write this wherever you prefer we'll just call it video one and um, this is the CATIA spreadsheet and you see it appears here um, and the virtual sequence and virtual ply um, data that's useful for importing into CATIA it's all right here. Now the th theory would be that this is imported into CATIA and the designer based on design features that he's aware of will either add or delete plies or change some of the layups and he would export then another spreadsheet uh, that then gets imported into hypersizer and this table is updated. 
After all this is done, um, it could be that you would want to save this state. Then um, after um, basically freezing, in fact, we use the term freeze, uh, we freeze the laminate here uh, for the top skin. And so you go to 114, you can see it's frozen as well. And at that point, um, the idea would be to um, reanalyze and then see if you still have positive margins of safety, um, in which case you can go um, perform stress reports. You may want to also consider at this point that maybe the load path has changed based on the design changes and you would want to have a way to update your FEM model with the updated stiffness terms of the panels and to quickly get a new um, refreshed uh, load um, state and then do your margin of safety reporting. So we'll use the loads icon to pull up the project setup form. We'll use the run abacus button to invoke hyper FEA. We'll go for one iteration since we simply want to get a updated snapshot of internal load and we'll start the process uh, by running hypersizer which will then create the property cards that then get updated into the FEM model at which point Abacus will run the model as you can see here and at that point um, after the Abacus solution is complete the loads get re-imported into Hypersizer and then Hypersizer will do one last uh, margin of safety calculation and to make sure that everything's in sync with each other. Now let's go back to the margins and we can see that they're all positive. Everything's okay.